Good morning. Isn't God good? Isn't Jesus awesome? If you know Christ as your Savior, not just a fact or not just as a religion, but you know Christ as your Savior, everything changes. Everything changes. Everything changes about you, about your past, about your present, and about your future. Everything changes. Nothing is left untouched. In this book, this Bible, has all of the answers to life and love and happiness and joy and purpose. All right here in this book. And we're going to read from this book today. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'd like for you to be able to follow along if you'd like to. You'll raise your hands. A lot of people do this. I did it last Sunday. Uh, we'll, give you a, we'll give you a Bible. You can read it. Uh, you can follow along. Uh, feel free to do that. If you don't have one at home, that's a, a newer translation. We'd love to give you this one. I'll give it to a friend if they don't have one. When you get that Bible, if you would turn to, just keep your hand up till one comes. I'll see a hand right over here. Uh, A couple more right over here. There we go. When you get that Bible, turn to the book of Luke. It's in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And and then find chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 is where we're going to be reading from today. Out of God's Word. Jesus uh, taught in different ways, but he often used stories to make his points and to teach his truth. Jesus sometimes would just throw out the facts, but more often than not, he told stories we call parables. And there are two things that happened when Jesus told a parable. Number one, it required the people listening to actually figure it out for themselves. I mean, I can say to you, doing this is wrong or doing that is good. But if I tell you a story that amplifies that truth, you're probably going to have to stop and think and figure it out. And so Jesus told parables so people would have to stop and think and figure it out for themselves. What does this thing mean? And then secondly, stories are memorable, right? I can give you five facts. You may not not remember them. But if I give you a story with that stuff in there, you're probably going to remember it. And the truth is, that's exactly what happened here. Because when Jesus told these parables... Luke didn't write them down. Dr. Luke didn't write them down until until two or three decades, 20 or 30 years after Jesus actually spoke these parables. These these stories had circulated for so long, and Luke was there when he heard it, so then he wrote it down 20 or 30 years later. That's how memorable this parable was. We're going to look at one of those parables today in Luke chapter 18, and it's known as the parable of the persistent widow or the unjust judge. That's what we've titled it today. And as I read this, I want you to follow along because what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a story that Jesus is telling. That he, he's trying to teach him a lesson. He's going to talk about a judge, a particular type of judge that ruled over an area. And he's going to talk about a particular type of lady. And listen to the type of judge and lady that he's talking about here. If you'll read with me, Luke 18, starting in verse 1. Now he, meaning Jesus, was telling them, he was talking to his disciples, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Now stop. This is very interesting. Jesus often told parables and he would leave it to the people to try to figure it out. But here, Jesus is actually going to tell, before he goes into the parable, he's going to tell his disciples, this is what I want you to get out of this, guys. I'm going to leave you with a story so you can remember this, but here's what I want you to know. That at all times you ought to pray and not lose heart. And he goes on in verse 2 saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him, the judge, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God, nor respect the man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she will wear me out. Now, the Greek phrase right there actually refers to being poked in an eye, in your eye, and it refers to, she's going to give me a black eye. She's going to embarrass me in the community. And I'm going to have to, just for the sake of getting her out of my hair and getting rid of her, you got to imagine, after, after, every day after the, he, he ruled, he would have to probably go get a, a, uh, something to drink in the local watering hole. And all his buddies were saying, man, just 
Give her what she wants. Get her out of your hair. Hmm. Even though I do not fear God, nor respect man. Yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? Will anybody be crying out to God day and night? Will anybody believe when he returns? Remember that phrase, crying out to God day and night. Is there anything that you cry out to God day and night about? Or have your prayers become habitual? Have they become, dear God, I got some choices to make. Not sure if I should do this or that. Could you show me which one to do? It would really be good if I had a good idea of what I should do here. Amen. But God, you're good. Amen. Have your prayers become just another thing that you do because you should? Or crying out to God day and night about a thing, does that happen with you? Is there anything in your life that you think, is worthy to cry out to God day and night about. This attitude that we come to God with, this habitual prayer, this passionless, oh God, thank you for this day, and you kind of go through your routine prayer. Can I just trash that? Throw that away. Stop it. It's meaningless. It's worthless. It's pointless. It doesn't get past the ceiling because at that point you're just repeating a rote prayer, don't we? We do that. I've done it. I should pray. I should even get on my knees. It looks like I'm serious to God. And I'll say my prayer. But what we have here is we have a picture, and I want to explain a little bit about the judge and the widow, but we have a picture of a widow here who has... No hope outside of the judge granting her what she needs. So let me tell you just a little bit about the judge and then about the widow. Judges historically were appointed by Moses in the desert when they were going. The the children of Israel were escaping Egypt and going to the promised land. When Moses had them in the desert, he realized he had a large group of people. He needed needed help legislating what, what the laws had to be. So he appointed men of God. He appointed judges to rule over the people. And these judges were to, um, to discern what the, the, uh, the Torah meant, and they were to apply it to the people. And when Moses picked these men, he didn't just pick anybody. I think I'll take you and you and you. He picked men that stood out from among the others as being incredibly godly. He picked men who everyone knew. These were godly fathers and husbands and servants. These were guys that they were the cream of the crop. They were obviously godly men. And so the entire tribe, the communities, they respected these guys. They respected the judges. They honored them. And that was just the way it was. Now fast forward to the day of Christ when this is being taught. That is no longer the case. What happened is over time, Greeks and Romans kind of took over. They came and they conquered the Israelites and Israel and Judah. And in that scenario, the Romans would appoint judges to rule over those areas. Look, I want you to go to the city. These Jews, they're a harassing bunch. They're a rowdy bunch. Go there and just try to keep the law, try to keep them under control, keep them under your thumb. And these judges that were appointed, it was a corrupt system, and they were corrupt men within that system. And so this judge that Jesus is talking about is not uncommon. Corruption was in the system. It wasn't a godly system. So when it says this judge neither feared God nor respected man, that was common in that day. That's the picture of the judge. He didn't care about God. He didn't believe in God. He didn't care about men. He was motivated by self-gain. And if you couldn't come to this judge with some money to bribe him, you might as well not come because you're not going to get justice. If you couldn't um, uh, afford legal representation that was really good, you better not come before this guy because he had no motivation to help you whatsoever. And that's the judge we're dealing with here, all right? Now, the widow. Let me tell you about the widow a little bit. The widow, according to Jewish tradition, the widow would be 60 years old or older. Let me tell you how we know that. 
if a woman's husband died and she was younger than 60 years old, it was expected that she would marry her husband's brother. Isn't that exciting? Aren't you glad we got rid of that one? I guess it kind of depends on your husband's brother, doesn't it? It was expected that she, well, she was younger than 60 years old. She would marry her husband's brother. That was the tradition. Now, let me add to that picture. The average teenage Jewish girl married by the, by the age of 14. That was just the way it was. By the time you were 14, you were promised off or you were already married. Also in that day, those 14-year-old girls began to give birth pretty quickly and gave birth to many litters of children over the years. Lots of babies. Lots of babies. Now, you talk with your average mom, and she'll tell you that, I, I don't know how you can calculate it, but so many years are taken off your life for every child you've given birth to. <laughs> you know, just the process itself. And then raising that child, you can, I'll probably take off five, seven, I, I, I'm making that up, but, but you know, it is true that the more that you stress your body and the more that you traumatize your body, the, the, the years you do take off. And the truth is this, these this culture was known, these young ladies, to give birth to lots of children. So here was the truth. The average age of a Jewish woman was under 40 years of age before they, when they died. Between the age of 30 and 40, they were done. And can you kind of, after all those children and, and, and all the abuse of the culture, because I'll tell you about it in a minute, they just kind of thought, I'm done. I'm ready. Take me, God. So to find a widow... Who was, who was not married, she was probably 60 years or older. She probably hadn't had all those children. She probably didn't have any other family to stand beside her. The fact that she's a widow and she goes before a king with no representation tells us that she was poor. She had no means. Women in that culture were not respected like they are in this culture. If you were a woman in a room full of men and you spoke, you were looked at harshly and told to zip it in Jewish phrases. Zip it. You really were very low on the totem pole. You didn't have any authority or any respect. So that's the picture Jesus is painting here. You see what he's done? An unjust judge who has no respect or desire to help anybody unless there's some self-gain and a helpless widow. Unjust judge, helpless widow. And Jesus, let me back up, says at all times you ought to pray and not lose heart. And then he tells us about this helpless widow and how she confronts this unjust judge. And she keeps on coming every day because the judge didn't have to rule in her favor. But what she could do, what she had in her, in her, uh, her arsenal of, atta- of, of weapons, she could just keep going back and back and back. And she did. He went back and, she just, and finally the judge just said, you know what, she's driving me nuts. I'm going to give her what she wants. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever been in a place that you were so helpless that all you could do was cry out to God until you got what you had to have, what you felt like you needed to have? I want to tell you a story um, that goes back a number of years, actually about 23 years. Uh, My wife and I were living in a little town called Ponca City, Oklahoma. We have moved from here to there to work with uh, a guy named Mark Silke. He was my youth pastor here, and he was now a pastor in a church. It was a church plant. It was a small church, and I knew I was going to go up there with no salary, but it was worth it. I thought I was supposed to go up there, and I was going to work in this church, and, and I had Natalie, and we were going to go do this thing, and we did it. And, and for six years, I worked in this church, and the church really never grew much because every time we would gain 10 or 15 people, the local economy was run by an oil company called Conoco. And Conoco was, we didn't know this, but they were starting to disintegrate and they were starting to ship people out. And so every six months we would gain 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 families and, and then they would be shipped out to Dubai, India or to Louisiana or to wherever. And it was very discouraging because the church never got quite big enough to be able to support me. I was the guy who led the worship and did the youth ministry. We would get to 80 to 100 people and then we would ship 20 of them off and we'd get to 120 and ship half of them off. And very discouraging. What happened was in that process was I was working uh, side jobs so I could do the ministry. My wife got a job at Conoco Oil making pretty good money. Now, there's a scenario. In the middle of that scenario, after nine years of marriage, Natalie gets pregnant. Pretty exciting, right? I was excited, except for this fact. She made twenty-five to 30000 a year. 
I made 12000 a year with my side jobs and doing ministry. I, I just had this strong conviction, that I, and I had had it for many years, that when we have children, and I know this is difficult in our culture today, so this is not meant to down anyone who can't do this, but I had this strong conviction that when my wife was pregnant, she should stay home and she should raise our babies. I just had this, I couldn't fight it. I couldn't run from it. It was this thing that God had planted in me from a young age. My wife should stay home. And, and I realized now she's pregnant and I make 12000 She makes twenty five to 30000 What's going to happen? What are we going to do? In the middle of this scenario, I was given a gift and I was allowed to go to Nashville, Tennessee. One of the ways that I made side money was I gave guitar lessons and I, uh, and I did studio work. I had a little studio and I produced music for people. I loved doing that, writing songs. And I was given a gift to go to Nashville, Tennessee, and to pursue some music. And I went to a thing called GMA Week. Anybody know what that is? Probably not. Gospel Music Association Week. And I went and sat in at all their conferences, and it was so cool. And we were told, look, when you go to Nashville, you got to visit this really cool church called Belmont Church. Because it's a really fun, cool church. And a lot of musicians, you know, I don't know if you know who Amy Grant is or Michael W. Smith, but in that day, they were like the, you know, the it in Christian music. And you got to go there because you're going to get to see them. And so Natalie and I, we went to Belmont Church, and we visited. And the night we were there, Michael W. Smith led the worship. And two days later, we went back for a Wednesday service, and Amy Grant led the worship. We're going, this is like Disney World of Christian music. This is incredible. We were so excited. And, and in the middle of all that, Natalie and I got, got called by a friend who lived in Nashville and says, hey, somebody's doing an album. They need background singers. You want to go beyond this album? Yes! So we, we got to go sing it, and it was like heaven for us. Then we went back home. Back to reality. The baby comes. I take a job working from 11 o'clock at night till 8 in the morning at a post office to go with my other jobs, trying to get ready for Natalie to be able to raise our child. One day, we get, probably a few weeks later, we get this letter in the mail, and it was a, as a thing for, that churches send out when you visit churches to fill the deal out like we've asked you to do today. It was a card, and it was uh, just welcoming me to, to having visited the church. I had no idea I was, you know, in Oklahoma. And it, and it basically said, pray for us as we search for a youth pastor. And I just kind of dismissed. I didn't anything twice about it. But a day or two later, one of the students, the college students in our group named Sam picked that up and he said, hey, Rick, did you see that they're looking for a youth pastor? I said, yeah. He said, you should apply. And I said, I should be an astronaut. <laughs> but I can't. There are no chances for me being an astronaut there are less chances for me being hired at that church as youth pastor. I am nobody from nowhere. Seriously. This is a 3,000 or bigger people church with a lot going on, a lot on the ball, and in my opinion, I had very little on the ball. So I just dismissed it. But that night, I couldn't sleep. I don't know what it was. I just couldn't sleep praying, you know, God, how am I going to support my family? How am I going to do this? How long can I work these various jobs? How, well, Lord, what are we going to do? So I got up that night, and I went down, and I opened the Bible. You ever open the Bible just to find one little thing you're hoping you open up on? Don't ever do that, really. You're not going to find anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I did it that night, and I opened it up, and the first thing that I found, the very, I put my finger down. I know. I put my finger down, and it said, David started his reign on his 30th year. And I was just about to turn 30. I don't know what that meant, but I felt like it was God saying, don't shrink back. David didn't shrink back. Go forward. Pursue the things that are on your heart. And suddenly I got kind of like, I'm going to fill out a resume. I'm going to send it to Nashville. They'll know who Rick Evans is. (laughs) So I did. I filled out a resume and I sent it away and they required five years of youth ministry experience and I'd had just a little more than that and I sent it away and months went by and then the phone went off and then right after the phone went off, (laughs) more months went by. (laughs) And brother, it happened to me, I was preaching one time and it went off in my pocket, not good. Months went by, but here's what happened. Uh, I got a packet in the mail about three or four months later and the packet was probably 25 or 30 pages thick. And, and I opened it up, and it was from Belmont Church. And it was a response to my resume. And I took it to my pastor, and, and I threw it on his desk and said, 
what do you think this is? And he looked at it and he, he said, Evans? He called me Evans. Evans, I think they're looking at you. I said, what? He goes, no, I think they're considering you. I said, why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but he said, I don't think they sent these out to 100 people. I think they sent these out to maybe 10 or less, maybe 15. And yeah, they're looking at you. And I thought, seriously? And his words were encouraging to me. They're looking at you. So I remember that night for the first time I prayed, God, Lord, could it be? I mean, could you do that? Could there's any way you could work this out uh, for me to get that job? Because, Lord, that would answer how I'm going to be able to support my family and not work four jobs or three jobs. And, and God, you know, is there any way, Lord, I don't think there's a way. I mean, I know me and I saw them and it doesn't seem to match up. But God, if there's any way, you see, my prayer was kind of very, very noncommittal and very, very distant because I didn't have any confidence that God could do this or that I was good enough for God to put forward. And so I just, that was my prayer. But listen, I started praying that every day and I prayed it again. And again, and I started, I got in a habit of praying it like every day. I, one of my jobs, as I mentioned, I drove a car three hours a day uh, delivering sensitive bank material. I was a courier. And I decided I was going to really go after it in the, during that time of prayer. So I, I started praying the Lord's Prayer. And I would go through the Lord's Prayer and stop at every section. And when I came to that section of the Lord, uh, you know, give me the daily bread that I need, I would stop and say, Lord, by the way, part of my daily bread may be given to me if I get that job. And I would go off on that thing for a minute. And I would just, and I would just oh God, would you please somehow make a way? And in the first few months, my prayers got a little more passionate over time and a little more passionate. Listen, four months later, I'm still praying this prayer. I've not heard anything from Belmont. I just read their newsletters every week and they hadn't hired anybody. And five months into it and six months into it, my prayers have gone from, Lord, if it's okay, now my prayers have gone to, God, here I am in my car. See me. Of course he saw me. Lord, if I'm not the person for this job, I'm not kidding, I did this. Make me the person for the job. God, if it's not your will, change your will. <laughs> Lord, if there's somebody else that's better than me, push him out of the way. <laughs> Whatever it takes, God, make me. See me. I'm trying to support my wife. You see, I just got kind of crazy with it. And I, I, I promise you, I did this for days. I decided I would pray morning, noon, and night. And I just, I just started praying like a madman because I didn't see any other way. You see, this was a possibility. And that the more I prayed, the more real it became. I mean, you would have expected for me to never have heard a thing. But six months later, I get a call. And it's the associate pastor of the church. And he says, is this Rick Evans? I said, yes, it is. Who's this? He goes, my name is Jim Beavis. I'm at Belmont Church. <laughs> Listen, you know, we've looked at your resume and I want you to know we started with about 100 guys. Maybe actually two or 300. We whittled it down to 60, down to 24, down to 12, down to 6, down to 3. And you're one of the three. And that's what I thought. And he said, we'd like to fly you out here. We'd like to interview you and talk with you a little more. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, let me think about that. I said, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I got on a plane a few uh, weeks later and went to Nashville and then interviewed. And I spoke in front of about 150 students. And I met with a, a group of youth ministry search team that was about 30 people. And the whole time I was there, honestly, I just kept crying out to God. And I felt God's presence like I never felt. I felt like when I spoke, somehow stuff was coming out. And I'm thinking... Wow, this is better than I am. You know, it was just, wow. And, and when I left the place, I, I left with a, a strong sense that God had taken me further than I could ever go in that time. And, and I go home and, and I continue to pray. And see, while I was praying, while I was praying, I didn't realize what was happening. But because I was pursuing God like this, I was praying at all times. And I wasn't losing hope about how to support my family. I was praying at all. I was just going nuts with it. Because of that, here's what happened. I, I was drawing near to God like I never had before. This need to supply for my family drew me to my knees. And, and going to my knees and seeking God, I was talking to God a lot. And the more I talked to God, the more God talked to me. 
And my prayers that started with a simple request turned into to pr- prayers of praise and prayers of, of, of depth and prayers of hope and, and prayers for, my, uh, for friends. And, and my prayer life increased. And I started reading his word more. And, and I, I found another scripture in Matthew that talked about there was a guy who had a friend visit him. Late. It was another parable. And a friend visited him. And he had no food to feed him. So we went to his neighbor and he knocked on his door. He said, neighbor, give me food. I need some bread for my friend. And the neighbor said, it's midnight. Are you out of your mind? The point of it was keep knocking. Knocking, don't give up. And I thought, I'm going to keep knocking. And I did. I get another call about a month later. A month later? Please, a month later. And, and it's this same guy. Hey, listen, you know, we've, we've whittled it down to two people and you're one of them. I need you to know one of them is pretty substantial. He is the youth pastor at a very, very large church in Washington, D.C. Uh, you probably don't remember who Dan Quayle is or C. Everett Coop, but those were political figures of the day. And he said, this guy ministers to the children of some very high political figures. He's, he's kind of a mover and shaker. He's highly educated. And then there's you. And he didn't say that. <laughs> but I, I felt like that. Rick from Salerno. Rick, who barely made it out alive with no puncture wounds from knives or bullet holes. Um, and, and I just, and, and he said this, and, but it didn't deflate me because I had been praying like a madman and just didn't even, I didn't think about it. I didn't really hear what he said because I had been praying. He said, so we want to fly you and your wife down here so we can get to know her. So in case she's off the hinge, you know, well, no, that's not going to work, you know. So they, they fly us down there and they meet Natalie and, you know, the deal's kind of you know, sealed there when you meet my wife and, and cause she's a servant spirit and she's, yeah, that's right. It, to know her is to know that she is my opposite completely, giving and humble and all that stuff. Anyway, so I, we go down there and, and it goes well. And I speak again to the people. And what I discover is, is the last, as I'm leaving town, I get called into his office, uh, Jim Beavis' office. And he said, Rick, listen, we got 28 youth ministry search committee people and 26 of them want you. But I'm going to make the decision. And I don't, I don't think it's you. He said, brother, I just want to be honest with you. What I appreciate I appreciated it. He said, the other guy just, man, he's really paid the price for an incredible, incredible education. And, you know, and so I just want you to know I'm, I'm not leaning that way and I don't expect that to happen. And I said, well, I appreciate your honesty and uh, thank you very much. And I uh, left his office, went home and told Natalie what he said. We, uh, we had one more night in the hotel free. So we stayed in the hotel. And, and that night I couldn't sleep, of course, and I, I penned a letter. I just said, honey, I need to write a letter to this guy. And I wrote him a letter explaining why I was the guy, honestly. Just saying, here's what God has done in me. Here's who I was. And here who is God is, who is God is making, here's who God is making me. And here's my journey from Salerno, Florida to here. And here's why you're gonna, really going to miss God if you go with just the education as a criteria for your choice. And then I put the letter in his, uh, I dropped it off at the church and I went home. We flew home. I didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. I kept praying, kept working the jobs. By that time, we'd given birth to our first child, Nate. And uh, I get a call about a month and a half later. Really? A month and a half? A month and a half later. <laughs> and, and it was Jim Beavis. He said, Rick, listen. He said, um, I had made a decision that didn't include you. And then I read your letter and he said, God just stirred my heart. And so, you know, we're going to offer you the position as youth pastor. Yeah, I just, I just, I I tried to be calm and tried to be, you know, I hung the phone up and I danced like David. (laughs) I called everyone I knew. You're not going to believe this. And we moved to Nashville. And I will tell you that that going to that church, it it actually started at a salary that equaled what Natalie and I were making together um, before the move. And that going to that church really launched me into a uh, a whole new field that just allowed me from then on to pretty much support my family in ministry. God heard my cry. He heard my cry. Now listen, to this day, I believe this. I was not the best choice for that position. I know that. I still had areas of undiscipline in my life. I still had deep areas of insecurity. I still had woundedness from my childhood and my father and that whole thing. I was still from Salerno. I had all these things that were still me, but the fact was... God heard my prayers. He heard my cries. And this was a thing that just absolutely still chokes me up. God saw me. He saw me. And I didn't deserve any of it. If I, I, if I could tell you who I was, 
and show you a picture, you'd say, bless his heart, you'd say. But God saw me. And I'm, I'm convinced to this day that God sees all of us. If he saw me, he sees you. And, and you may not feel like you deserve your prayers to be answered. But I'm going to tell you today, you find a thing. You find that thing that needs to be fixed in your, in your relationships, whether it's your marriage or your children. Fathers, I had a friend one time come up to me and he said, he was a youth pastor, and he said, you know, my kids are starting to rebel and I don't know what to do. And it just, it's, the whole family is starting to fall apart and it's not pretty. And, and he's telling me this stuff. And I just remember I got overwhelmed um, and I said, look, man, go in there and pray with them. You know, go in there, knock on their door at night. He goes, yeah, but they're like 15 and 16. I said, all right, that's, that's what, I'll tell you what, dude. You go kneel down by their door after they're in bed and you cry to God. And you do it every night for a year. You don't give up on your kid. You're the gateway to your family. And whatever you allow in that gate goes down to your wife and your children. You're the gateway. You cry out to God on behalf of your family. And you don't give up until you see something going on. Because God will hear your prayers and orchestrate events for you. He didn't listen to me. And he's not married today. And he's lost the respect of all his family. A youth pastor. God calls us men to lead. And we do it, I'm not kidding you, on our knees before God. We don't wield our power and authority. We go to God and he establishes who we are through a servant father or a friend or your boss or whoever needs God in their lives. You're the one that brings that to fruition in your prayers. Be a praying person. If you've been casual in your prayers, stop it. Stop it. Push it out. It's like being casual in worship. Really, how can you worship God casually? I mean, that's not worship. That's just showing up. You know what I'm saying? Look, if you are not experiencing God's presence, I have people that come up and, and they, they say, I'm not experiencing God's presence and I don't, I'm not feeling God. And I just have to say to them, you pursue him based on who he is, not who you are or what you're feeling. Read his word and find out who he is. And you seek him and you praise him based on that, whether you feel anything or not. Seek him with all your heart. Get on your knees and pray for your friends. And don't stop. Pick out the relationships that need God's hand and you apply consistent, persistent prayer. And God will move. And in the process, you will change. You will change. You'll find yourself wanting to know more about this God that you're experiencing in prayer. You'll read his word more. God will begin to use you because now you're becoming a vessel that he can actually fill with his spirit and use. And it literally changes everything about your past and how you view it. And all that woundedness starts getting healed up and undone and fixed. And your present begins to change right now in how you're living your life. And your future, it changes everything. And you hold the key. God has given you the ability to get on your knees and to seek God and to pray to God continuously. Jesus said, don't be, don't be discouraged. Pray all the time. Can I ask you to close your eyes today? Would you do that? If you're a Christian today, if you're a Christian today, I want you to ask God right now, God, make me a praying man, make me a praying woman, make me a praying student, make me a praying daughter or a praying son or a praying friend or a praying boss or a praying employee. God, make me someone who targets relationships and woundedness and places that need healing. And God, would you please, and you just start targeting those things in prayer. And throw the casual prayer out the window. The non-passionate worship him, but toss it. It doesn't get past the ceiling. You go to God. This widow was helpless. That's the picture that Jesus painted. And God says, I am not the unrighteous judge. I am a loving, merciful God. I'm the opposite of this guy. And when you come to me and you pray to me day and night and you cry to me, I will answer your prayers. And when you come to him pridefully, you're not the hopeless widow. When you come to him thinking you've got it all in order, you just need to help him you to help you tweak it a little bit. That's not it. You come to God helpless because you can't you are unable to affect change in these areas, but God is. Christians, could I ask you right now, could you recommit your your life to God? And would you just say to God, God, I'm going to work at becoming a prayer person, someone who prays morning, noon, and night. God, I'm going to target the things that are important, the things I let go of years ago or months ago that I should have continued to pray about. 
My mother prays for me and has for many years, and I believe it's why I'm where I'm at today. I pray for my children and believe it's why they're where they're at today. God hears our prayers. Would you recommit today to being a praying Christian, a praying follower of Christ who runs hard after God's heart and doesn't let go until he gets it? Today, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I, I humbly but strongly urge you to give it up and just surrender your life to Him. Your sin separates you from God. God is a holy and a righteous God. And your sins make you unholy and unrighteous. And God, you cannot be in God's presence. And you certainly can't spend eternity with God in heaven because of your sin. And Jesus comes and says, I will stand as a sacrifice for your sins. I will pay the price of death that's required for your sins. If you'll believe in me and trust in me, it's a gift that's given to us, but I can give you a gift. If you don't receive it or open it, it doesn't have any impact in your life. Today, we're asking you, are you willing and ready to receive the gift of salvation? If you would, just pray this prayer with me. If you are, I ask you to pray this prayer right now to God. God, you see me here in this place, and you know that I need forgiveness of all my sins, and I need a relationship with you. I need to know Jesus as my Lord. God, I need you to be my God. Today, I proclaim my belief in Jesus as my Lord. Today, I receive the gift of salvation and forgiveness of my sins. Today, I choose to follow Christ. God, be my God. And I pray this in Jesus' name.